Lady Madame. Lady... <laughs> I have one drink. Right on cue. La- I know. Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames and messieurs, welcome to a brand new Friend or Fed, the show that examines people's priors. Uh, today we have an exceptionally interesting uh, panel. The, uh, uh, we, of course, we have uh, returning guest Peter Canones uh, from the Peter Canones Show and Curtis Yarvin uh, from graymirror.substack.com. Uh, Curtis, uh, like I said in the email, in, invite in email, you were the first subject of Friend or Fed over a year ago. So in many ways, you are the reason this show exists. I wasn't on that one. (laughs) Fascinating. Fascinating. Full circle. Uh, So are we going to talk about Kyiv? Because, you know, you said you said you grew up in a in a Ukrainian household. Was that that was actually speaking Ukrainian like you spoke that language? No, third generation. No. My, my, my yeah, okay, grandfather, okay. my grandfather had a very, uh, who was sort of the patriarch of the family, had a very uh, <clears throat> sort of classic, tenacious, uh, sort of a problematic relationship with his family. So I think when uh, when his grand when his parents died, he kind of made a big split, and so we, uh, you know, Orthodox religion was sort of kind of around, but we we didn't really observe, and uh, it was a big push to not speak uh russian or ukrainian or polish uh in the house at all uh, it was only english and french so, so but it was of... a, it was ukrainian rather than russian speaking family originally or it was predominantly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i mean As, again I mean, when, when you get into those kind of territories it's like well w- wizzle wazzle what are you like uh, yeah like, right you know right cause... see because because what i wonder every time i hear the name of the city Kiev, right? You know, I'm always like, you know, I'm here like Kiev, right? And it's to me, I don't know Russian, I don't know Ukrainian, but I sort of process this, I think the way it sounds like a similar difference between like German and Swiss German, you know, it's Deutsch, you know, like Deutsch. I think to a German it sounds like German being spoken by a duck who's been breathing helium. And I wonder if just sort of the, like the feel that Russian get Russians get off of these Ukrainian names like Kiev or Zelensky or whatever has that sort of the clownish mouth feel to it. Well, to, I think I think what's really happening is the whole Kiev thing, the rebranding of Kiev is to is is actually this is this is a point I wanted to get to, but uh, this is it's good, actually kind of ties into Joe Rogan in some ways. Um, there seems to be like this sort of um, desire for uh, transcendence past history, and the Soviets did this brilliantly. The Russians have done this what three times now, right? Where the Soviets basically transcended their history from from uh, from classic uh, sort of Russian Empire. Uh, and created this whole new thing. Then after the fall of the Soviet Union, the, the Russian uh, Federation just basically recreated itself as well and saying, well, you know, history, mm, right? Um, I think with the Kiev thing, it's like it's sort of this rebranding of Kiev, which is mm. historical, which has historical Russian roots, which is, you know, it's in some ways the birthplace of, of, the, Ky- of the Kiev Rus, of the entire almost Slavic, whatever that is. Uh, and now they're rebranding it into this Kiev thing, which is neither, ne- which is neither neither. It's this own new well, birthplace yeah. of history. As, as I understand it, for most of certainly my life, um, Kiev was a Russian-speaking city, and you know, it's it's like when you, <clears throat> what they're doing with this Ukraine thing is sort of so fascinating because it's like this like blast from the past of like 20th century and even 19th century, like linguistic nationalism, like, you know, the Czechs, you know, tirelessly struggling against the iron heel of the Habsburgs. Right. And, and, you know, and it's sort of the same thing. It's like, basically you have these languages that are marginal languages, basically kind of rural languages, like sort of like Welsh or something. And, the kind of natural path of a language which especially has kind of fallen to sort of a lower level on the socioeconomic tier and is basically like essentially a rural language to a substantial degree. Of course, Lenin tries to bring it back for actually very similar kind of screwed up reasons like in the 20s, right? In the 20s, there's this attempt to like have the Soviet of the nationalities or whatever. And that that's coming from really sort of world progressive thought it's coming from the same place that like diversity comes from here but you know this thing of like okay i'm 
you know, this powerful foreign empire and I'm going to stir up your linguistic minority in order to cause trouble as though like, you know, the Germans had been funding the Welsh and like, you know, rebelling against the English and finding their deep Welsh identity or whatever. Right. You know, and, 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 you know, this whole idea that a language means an identity, which means a nation, which means a nation state, which means a government, which means basically a projection of the British empire onto your soil is like so it's it's just it's so old-fashioned and you know the idea that they can sort of be doing this again today with this incredible global pr campaign where like local buses and like I, as i personally saw like buses in like the middle of backward backwater portugal are like you know slava ukraini right you know it's this amazing thing how do you yeah. like uh, you know I don't know. Like, I'm just like, I didn't think it was possible to be that crude in this age. And yet no. here is this. I was, I was I'm sorry, as, as more no. simple than that. I just thought it was like the establishment of an in-group marker. Like if you pronounce it this mm -hmm. way, you're on board with the narrative. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. 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 But that's all, that's all linguistic nationalism is like, but if you you'll like, notice, yeah. sorry, Curtis, but just, just yeah. to add on to that, you'll notice they, they don't do the same thing with Livov. Which is Polish. Like, Livov has a Polish root because it used to be part of the Polish Lithuanian Empire. Aren't you supposed to say Lviv? Lviv? Well, whatever. Yeah, like, yeah but yeah. I mean, <laughs> they they've done a number on Kiev, but Livov is still like Livov or Lviv or whatever you want to, however yeah. you want to. That that one's they don't. Yeah, because it doesn't need to be across the board. You just establish that yeah. one. And yeah, I mean, because yeah, because what you're doing with these sort of acts of linguistic dominance is you're just alphaing the whole population. And so, if you basically live in a city, and then you know, like the, I mean, Estonia had been part of the say what you want about the Stalin. Estonia had been part of the Soviet Union for basically 40 years at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union and half the, not half, I think 20, 30%, at least of the people there are Russian. And so basically when they say, Hey, your street signs aren't in your own language, you're going to have to learn Estonian, which is this like thing that like makes like Finnish look like baby English or something, you know, uh, in order to keep your job and your passport, right. This way of like expressing dominance, is so it's sort of so emotionally powerful. It's like imagine, you know, here's here's sort of a story I tell. Please please don't take this as a proposal. Okay? This is a thought experiment. But like here's my thought experiment. So you know, sometimes Republicans will ask me, what do we need to do to beat the Democrats? How can we finally own the libs? And I'm like, guys, here is one simple policy you can take, doesn't hurt anyone, purely symbolic. You know, but if you do this, you will have owned the libs. You will have totally beaten the Democrats. And they're like, what? And I'm like, it's very simple. Take every street in the United States and name for Martin Luther King and name it after Robert E. Lee instead. And of course, you're like, you're, 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 your Republican will be like, well, what, what good would that do? Like, how would that help? Right. Well, no, it's not going to help. It's basically showing that you can do that is showing that you have walked all over every liberal in the country. And basically power itself, which is the power that names streets, power cares about your concerns, which is that, you know, this great American Robert E. Lee be honored. And whereas power has decided that Martin Luther King was a plagiarizing, cheating communist, right? And, and so by sort of enforcing that in the form of these street name changes, you basically show most people are sort of not really deep in their convictions. They want to go with the winning side. And when you basically show, no, we're going to actually change the street names. Yeah, there's some budget costs and like paint and green paint and whatever. We're going to do this. Then, you know, you're basically showing every amoral aspiring young person in the world which saw which you you know power's foot is in right. yeah, it's the right wing equivalent of rainbow crosswalks exactly exactly stars and bars crosswalks you know and exactly. the thing is you're basically saying i'm gonna take your the thing that you ritually believe in i mean literally we have now a legal system where actually you know the pride flag you were charged with political crimes for burning a, a pride flag but you can burn an american flag no problem right you know and when you see that you see i mean people used to get in real legal trouble for burning american flags back in the yeah. 60s right you know and when you see basically that's just the kind of demonstration of where power is 
okay, it's a mistake to say that sort of changing it symbolically will have that effect. But yeah, actually, if you don't have the power to change all those crosswalks and all those street names and all those flags in that way, you don't have the power, period. And like, that's a good way of defining the level of power you need to get to beat these people. Yeah. Pete, is that, so is that to show you where we're at right now? If that's what's going on is the opposite. Yeah, I, that's always, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Pete? I just don't ever remember having Chicken Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. You should try the turkey Livov. It's, it's fantastic out here. I'll tell you a funny story I heard about this Ukrainian language thing from a friend of a friend who was an Ukrainian Jew and he he emigrated as like a young teenager with his family you know and in the mid 90s by which time this Ukrainianization thing had already been going on I mean these were just arbitrary administrative you know definitions that Stalin sort of created to get more seats at the United Nations, right? You know, and and then they get dismembered by Washington, you know, as a way of winning the Cold War. But like, come on, man, this was part of Russia. And the the story is that the USSR had broken apart and this guy with his family had to emigrate or they were wanted to emigrate and they were Jews because they're Jews and the Jews in at least since Yiddish was no longer a thing, the Jews in the Ukraine always spoke Russian, right? They're never Ukrainian speaking Jews. That's that's weird, right? And and the like because it's a language of peasants and not just peasants, but like Goy peasants, right? You know, well, no Ukrainian spoke Ukrainian. The, the only language enclaves were basically in Toronto, Chicago, and a few other places, like in, in, in yeah. uh, Winnipeg. So, right, uh, they yeah. actually had to import people over to Ukraine after after ninety one to teach Ukrainians how to speak Ukrainian, Ukrainian. because yeah. because of Catholic yeah. grade, yeah. Yeah, because it's like it was practically a dead language, but it get res gets resurrected as the language of this like corrupt regime building project, right? And which we now know as um, well, I guess we got the thought we now know as Ukraine, right? And so anyway, this guy's dad has to get a Ukrainian passport in order to emigrate, and so in order to get a Ukrainian passport needs to pass a Ukrainian language test, which is like basically asking you if you wanted to get a passport to leave America to get a, like a language test in like Gula or something, right? You know, the language Clarence Thomas was gonna, like Haitian Creole, Jamaican English, I don't know, something like something really. And I'm sure it sounds like kind of like regular normal human speech, but very cringe. But it's also kind of focused on the simple lives of the simple people who speak it. So, you know, this guy's dad is reading this test and he's like, you know, encounters uh, he, the question, what is the Ukrainian word for helicopter? And he's like, you know, I know the Ukrainian word for plow. I even know the Ukrainian word for tractor, for horse, I know, for goose, I know. But it's like being asked to say, how do you say genome sequencer in like Jamaican, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, th so this is the like, this is the clown show that everyone around the world is supposed to get as excited about as as climate change and maybe it's even supplanted climate change in some people's minds and so they're totally not worrying that the world is going to get you know one and a half degrees warmer in the next 30 years uh which i can tell you i'm just turning 50 is far from my biggest worry about the next 30 years and and the uh and they're focused on this ukraine thing it's just like and 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 it's so weird and sick because it's like you know, you're just like into this war. You just like you're on your well on your way to killing half a million people. And it's like glorious. It's like good TV. It gets you like a hard on when you renew your New York Times subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, right. How do you it's, feel? Is that too cynical for you? Do you? No, not at all. I mean, look, I said from the very we've been following this the war from the very beginning. Uh, I was uh, I described myself as a Ukrainian nationalist for the better or for worse uh, since 91 uh, uh most because i was raised to hate the russians like you know right that's, that's yeah. a pretty standard thing and, mm -hmm. and as sure. i progressed as i got older and it you know i would say that i'm a an armchair historian in terms in terms of uh in terms of russian especially ukraine and poland mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when this war broke out 
I said from the very start, it's this is a disaster. Like there is yeah. the 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 time to inter, to for the U.S. or the West to intervene would have been in 2004 with with Yashchenko mm -hmm. and the color revolution yeah. there. This whole this whole uh, trying to rearm Ukraine uh, over the pandemic and stuff that was was uh, was an absolute disaster and, and has shown. Um, there's there's there the 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 idea of, of Ukrainian sovereignty is now off the table, and that was something that was a bit was a, was a very bitter pill to swallow, but but necessary from and I, I think there's a whole bunch of other things that have happened over the last few years that have kind of opened my eyes. Um, you know, uh, not to shine your shoes too much, Curtis, but you were integral in that. Um, yeah. You know, you take one red pill and all of a sudden you start taking them all. <laughs> um, and when you start to question these narratives and you start to see that, that yeah, the, the, the idea of, of, of Ukrainian sovereignty was always a lie, that this is mm -hmm. always going to come down to either it being a suburb of Poland or falling back to the, into the Russian Federation. And actually, probably the best uh, case scenario for the Ukraine or for the majority of it would be to be part of Russia, like officially, so all the way from Odessa to, sure. to Kiev or Kiev or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, <laughs> And yeah. and that's and then and then let the and then let the rest carve off carve it off the rest to Poland and then that's going to be it, like that's why yeah. I that's how I see this 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 uh, th this is the end result. Keep and in mind also, sorry, I'll finish this thought. Yeah. Keep in mind also that the the, the Ukraine had been uh, been designated uh, by um, what was it, the uh, Plan Twenty Thirty of the EU to make Ukraine the bread the breadbasket of Europe, not just not just the not just the East. What's what what's what they're doing explains what they're doing in Holland with the, with the Dutch farmers. They're they're the big plan was to to do a lot of stuff in Ukraine, mostly because of the, of the fertilizer crisis that we're about to experience in the, in, in all, mm. of the, all of the globe. Russia is the number is the number one holder of nitrous fertilizer. Uh, Morocco, for some reason, has the number one um, uh, supplier of um, uh, of the other form. And in and, Ukraine, you have the black earth, and you barely need fertilizer exactly yeah. so yeah. that's that's what they're going to war over this is actually a war over shit well, like well literally. you know i like ironically you know this takes us in a different you know historical direction but we'll get to joe you... rogan sometimes folks don't worry <laughs> we'll we'll get to there. There. But, there, but there's now, a circle but... there is a circle back in here and pete but jump first, in anytime first hitler first hitler so so when hitler of course invades the ukraine <laughs> and you probably no Curtis, just as, just to put this put this out here if this devolves into a into a live to, into a live watch of hitler lives i'll be happy with that i will consider that <laughs> i don't you know, that's my joke do you know uh, like like six feet six feet away from me i have a bunch of uh medals from world war ii but i actually have a crim shield an actual crim shield from uh, what is it from crim uh, i don't know like my i don't know my, any, my Nazi any germ German. any german who served in um it served in the Ukrainian campaign, 41 to 42, got one. Wow. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So the thing is that when, you know, uh, I think that, you know, uh, there's this um, there's this myth that, uh, well, it's, it's like when you, the Germans in Nuremberg are charged with sort of two great crimes. One of them is the murder of the Jews, which is absolutely true, they did commit. And the other is plotting to take over the world, which they're almost entirely innocent of. And, you know, what they were not less not entirely innocent of and sort of what reflects the kind of deeper kind of German military infrastructure under, you know, this whole like Nazi romantic, like blood and soil, lemon shroud stuff, you know, what's in in the minds of the like sincere like military planners in germany the kind of people who fought world war one not like freaks like hitler is basically the fact that germany is not food self-sufficient i mean obviously hitler, hitler knew this too but like that's not the way he marketed it germany only produced like 60 percent of its calories so effectively if the you know area of eastern europe to germany's east is a satellite of Britain, then Britain can just squeeze Germany's balls the way it did in 1919 and just starve Germany and Germany can never be sovereign. And so, you know, you're sort of seeing what really reflects this, this invasion of the East is the sort of very concrete desire by the German state to basically get what it needs to be sovereign. And of course, the agricultural resources of the Ukraine are like a big part of that. 
And yeah, so, yeah, yeah so, there's, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, just, yeah. just to speak to the authenticity of my co-host on this topic, he's the only person that I remember actually bitching about Putin pre 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's so not he's, a. He's... No, I mean Putin is Putin is pretty much what the West thinks he is, right? You know, but he's also, but the Ukrainian regime is pretty much not what the average NPR listener thinks it is, and <laughs> like you know, especially seeing just the just incredible brazenness of the corruption there that really you know sort of embroiled significant American figures, and you're just like that was not a well-functioning state that was not is not and like i think you can correct me if i'm wrong but like i think there are aspects even before this disastrous war there were aspects that were very like you know less like russia in the putin era and more like russia in the yeltsin era and i don't think anyone thinks of russia in the yeltsin era as a success it's a very difficult situation i mean to give to give Putin any kind of his dues. I mean, he's been dealing with, yeah, post Yeltsin, post, post Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union, massive corruption, which he had, a, which he had to do to, to wrestle with and get under control, depending on who you listen to. And again, the, the hardest part with all this stuff, uh, and this is well, maybe I'll try to tie this back into Rogan is that inputs and outputs here are getting are getting confused so and deliberately so i think by everybody i, I don't think russia wants anyone to really know what's going on in russia it is mm -hmm. that isn't playing to their their hand it, it you know when i've always heard western uh thought leaders try to say that russia is just ruled, ruled by a bunch of oligarchs i mean yes that is true and is also not true putin is not is not stalin uh yeah, no, very you know, true. he's 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 at best he's a he's he's a he's a mafia lawyer uh and that's kind of always been his role it's why he always turns to 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 law uh be it international or or, or otherwise um he's he's a very he's very savvy uh at knowing how to apply pressure and get leverage uh and that's been shown like the stuff he's been able to do in what 25 years or so is pretty damn good all considering for for russia but it's it's not going to be him who continues it on the the interesting thing now tell me right yeah the, the two interesting things that have come out of this war now is well maybe three is that the sanctions didn't work and they and the russians sidestepped the sanctions by by having an entirely parallel ec economic model already set up to kind of deal with it um and that didn't happen overnight like they had that plan over eight years um, relationships with the BRICS nations are, is, is something to really to, to look for, to, to keep an eye on. And, um, and now Russia is now because of this war now has the most powerful military in the world in terms of, in terms of experience, anything they send, any ground forces sent into, to attack that Russian force is going to get chewed up period. Like they have more experience, more battle experience now than any other st major standing army in the world. So that's major that and is, yeah that is something really you know i was talking to a ukraine stand the other day kind of in sort of somewhat drifting in the somewhat spartan pro-ukrainian direction and he was emphasizing sort of the spartan nation of the ukrainians that has been created and i guess you know this some of that is a real you know war war is the health of the state so these should be like healthy states it's kind of cool to see this like battle trained force you know emerge as a result of you know so much suffering but i think the real i mean especially considering like what's in the news now i think the question we should really focus on on this stream is joe is rogan a friend rogan <laughs> rogan or Prigozhin separated at birth <laughs> <laughs> very similar look actually you know i think it, yeah, I think you it's know and they both have they both have presence they both yeah. have charisma. You could imagine imagine Prigozhin doing a talk show. You could totally see it. And what is he up to the, now? The, the Prigozhin what, what, experience. Yeah, the Prigozhin yeah. experience. You know, the, the <laughs> Spotify could license it. You have know, you, segue into you, the Rogan experience of the Prigozhin experience. Uh, what is Dugan he up to now? Like, Dugan, Dugan, have you done DMT? Have you tried the <laughs> DMT? <laughs> You're kind of mixing them. Uh, what is he up to now? What is this progression stunt? What is this crazy thing I read about? I, you know, I, I honestly, 
uh, now he's challenging the defense minister. He's basically uh, the, the news is calling it a coup against the, against the Russian defense minister. Uh, I I look at that as a as a giant soap opera. I don't believe anything out of anyone. The only thing I honestly believe, Curtis, at this point is maps. And I've and I've yeah. this is the thing I've always yeah. turned to people uh, who've been telling me that this war is going to be over and and you, the plucky Ukrainians are going to win this thing and blow everything out of the water and all this stuff. I say, look, 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 here's the map, right? Now you tell me how the how this red area that keeps advancing into this blue area is losing. You you explain that to me and I and I will listen. I'm all for it. I'm I you know, I I want less Ukrainians dying. That's my objective that's what I would like to see. Less people who look like me dying for nothing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so no. if we can we, we can figure that out. I'm all for it. But it's strange. Uh, it was, everything it's strange else is that, just. It's a strange that the supporter of the Ukrainian nation would have that perspective. That's a really weird. Guys, he's just carrying weird, water for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Wagner Best in Hell? The no. movie they made? No. Oh my God, that's so worth seeing. It's so good. It's really, really good. It's actually a really good war film, believe it or not. Like it's a scripted feature film about urban warfare in like, you know, Popasna, I think. And it's just like everyone you see on the, um, everyone you see on the screen is like an actual mercenary and that sounds like fun. i mean w wagner is basically the french foreign legion i mean that's that's right. the, yeah. Yeah. the way to yeah. look at it um there i mean there there are foreigners in 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 wagner back how, how are we pronouncing that now is that is like kiev now is like wagner. 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 wagner wagner yeah, yeah. Wagner. um uh but yeah it's uh it's it's basically the french foreign legion of uh, now the interesting thing will come out of it because i think the person who will succeed Putin is not going to be an oligarch or another lawyer. It's going to, I think it's going to be a general, uh, nice. someone who's going to be coming out of that mm. war. So I think that's most likely <clears throat> because they're going to have to be on a war footing for the next 25 to God knows how many years. Right. Sure. Uh, it's just yeah. straight up. It's straight up trench warfare there. I mean, you know, I feel like there are probably ways in which sort of more, sort of more better and bigger clouds of fpvs could kind of overwhelm this like trench warfare structure but you know because there's sort of a gap like there's it seems to me that somewhere between these like consumer uavs and these like very high cost you know very one-off defense uavs there's a there's a storm you know they're i mean you've seen these clouds of dragon you know drones over china doing a dragon dance with like thousands of drones right just take those things put some tnt on them and like make them attack and probably these forces have trouble defending themselves against that but that technology isn't really available at you know now and so what we're seeing is basically not really super different from a world war one or world war two battlefield like and it's it's ugly out there it's not you know it's okay, let's fun. let's transition here because we're at the thirty minute mark and we haven't even <laughs> the, the, the chat's having it. their own debate. I mentioned, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. It's good. And look, the, the, this show is is based around two two concepts: clickbait and free willing discussion. I, I put I put right. no limitations on where we can go because uh, let's get back to Rogan and Prigozhin. Let's let's, but, let's uh, even start with Rogan. Pete, uh, any first initial thoughts on 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 uh, on uh, Joe Rogan? Uh, you know how the show works. Uh, friend, de definitionally, friend is is anyone who's who's allying themselves or giving the dissident right uh, new ideas, concepts, uh, uh, something to go with, uh, some sort of positioning, uh, or at least not burying us. And uh, the and the Fed is. Uh, is everyone who's not doing that? Um, of course, you can always be be a Fed, but not be on the payroll. Uh, quite often, with people who are who are basically doing the, the Fed's work for them without being paid, is kind of the worst Fed of all. Pete, any initial thoughts on Joe Rogan? Well, his podcast has had has been two things, but at different times. I mean, it started out just as a bro show. We would talk about UFC, stuff like that. He would talk about how the moon landing was faked and things like that. Um, then all of a sudden, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson comes on the show and it gets serious and he can get like any interview he wants in the world. Up until this point, he's just had these UFC guys on. DeGrasse Tyson.